And today, crypto teaches me what it's like to be a man. <laughs> uh, you haven't learned yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And am I a man, crypto? <laughs> now, if you are new to this channel, we go heavy into detail in the books and short stories that we read. We are going to bring out a lot of the hidden interpretations and meanings in this story today. If you are down for that, please consider hitting the subscribe button. And as always, we start off with publication information. And today we are going over A Man Who Was Almost a Man by Richard Wright. This was published in 1961 as a part of the Wright's compilation, Eight Men. Now, this is a very easy coming-of-age story. I can see why this is one of the most popular American stories. And this sneaks in the struggles of class and racial divide that I feel like a lot of people may miss out on. And I really want to focus in for today's talk. That's going to be something that I really want to hit home and kind of see, kind of bring out just how subtle of a writer right was yeah and the other thing i want to point out is this is the pinnacle of what a gun represents in stories in literature it does arguably mm. the best job ever of giving you the easiest way of understanding what firearms usually represent in stories all right so what we're going to do is go through a quick plot breakdown and then go into our discussion and analysis of this piece so this is a third person limited narrative over dave's shoulder 17-year-old Dave vents his frustration at the other field hands on the Hawkins plantation. He wants to purchase a gun to show everyone that he's a man. And he heads to Joe's store where he gets a catalog and Joe offers him a gun for $2. Dave returns home and tries to coerce his mom into allowing him to purchase the gun. After discussion his mom agrees to allow him to purchase the gun as long as they give the gun to his father now dave purchases the gun but stalls coming home until his family is asleep and then the next morning wakes up early so that his mother can't confiscate the gun that he just purchased dave heads to work with the gun strapped to his leg and there he takes jenny the mule out to do work in the fields now and what dave does is he takes out that gun and closes his eyes to shoot. And when he opens it after shooting, he realizes that he has shot Jenny the mule dead. <laughs> I laughed out loud. <laughs> now he tries to lie to Mr. Hawkins and saying that the Jenny's owner, that, uh, that Jenny fell on the blade and has a story that's just completely unbelievable. And after some pressure from the town, from his family, he comes out and says, no, I, I shot the gun. I shot Jenny with the gun, and then I buried the gun. And his mom kind of says, well, you're going to have to go get that gun. And Mr. Hawkins says, well, you're going to have to pay me 50 bucks for that dead mule. Now, later that night, Dave sneaks out to where he hid the gun, digs it up. Dave keeps his eyes open this time and fires the gun successfully. He then decides he's a man and will travel to another place where he can be seen as one and hops on a train and plot. So for analysis, my first question for you, Crypto, is why does Wright feature a young black man as a protagonist for this story, you think? I think right from the beginning, obviously, this story is a lot about racial classes, and I think he's writing to a black audience. I think he's mm -hmm. writing to specifically young black men in the South, and that they don't have to be defined by what others tell them of being a man. And that comes down to a lot of the story is, is what does it really mean to be a man? And I think as a, a culture that can be defined by a family, could be defined by religion. And I think that right here is trying to come out to his young black fellow compatriots and saying, you don't have to define yourself as a man by other people's standards. And specifically, the old way of the South thinking of what we are as men or not as men. And it's worth pointing out to maybe some people who aren't as familiar with this era that post-Civil War in the Jim Crow era, there were a lot of tenant and sharecropping relationships set up between white farmers who owned land and had a lot of money and power and basically extorting, making black people work for as minimal money as possible, getting labor for as cheap as possible. That Basically, it was impossible to get ahead. You were constantly borrowing, you were constantly poor, and you were constantly unsure how life could be better. 
And Wright is depicting that in the story without beating you over the head or making it obvious. You're just in the narrative of it, which is really good writing from Wright's perspective. Yeah, he's telling these young men that, look, we've been trapped in this for so long and we've lived in poverty and we've we've had to beg, borrow and steal and we're not getting in ahead of here. Why do we have to define that as what we truly are? And that if you can escape this, maybe you can be more. Now, here's a interesting point is that the boy will cower at the presence when men enter into the scene. We have a quote, one of these days he was going to get a gun and practice shooting. Then they couldn't talk to him as though he were a little boy. So when Dave enters the store, Joe's store, as soon as Joe enters, what's he do? He cowers. When he goes home, does he immediately demand to purchase the gun? No. He waits for his little brother and dad to leave the room to approach his mother. When he's approached by Mr. Hawkins after shooting the mule, does he immediately come forward? Nope. It's after his dad forces him as almost the alpha to beta male relationship to come out and tell the truth. So Dave is constantly cowering at other men in the story. And he's viewing this gun as his salvation, his way out. Why? Ultimately, being a young man is about choices. And he figures that if he has that gun, he can make more choices. And it comes down a lot to age, I think, as well, because he is seen as younger. And it even comes back to that that insult of just the word boy has multiple implications here to him. It is one a ageist thing saying you're younger than me so you're lesser than and more importantly this is a racial derogatory dig at him and you know it usually it's said in like a boy and it, it, it's gonna hit him harder for that reason and so that gun is gonna give him an opportunity to get away from those those two things that are pulling him down so we typically don't go into a lot of detail because we touch on it on so many videos in so many short stories in so many books the gun represents achieving manhood by owning a gun and it means multiple things and there's a lot of complexity to how authors break it down But once you have that gun, you will not be looked down upon by other men. You will be the man in charge. You will make decisions and have control of your life as opposed to being the boy where you don't have controls and others look down upon you. Yeah, he wants to purchase his manhood. And we have a good quote from the story. In the gray light of dawn, he held it loosely, feeling a sense of power. Could kill a man with a gun like this. Kill anybody, black or white. And if he were holding his gun in his hand, nobody could run over him. They would have to respect him. So here's an interesting question. Does the gun give him power or does it give him equality? I think maybe too it gives him maybe equity in himself, right? It's closing Mm. that racial gap that he's feeling and that age gap that he's feeling between his parents and all these men and between white and black men. It seems to me that... We have a very complex view of what does the gun represent here in the story, because if Du Bois was writing the story, he would point out that the gun could get him equality at the moment, but in the end, the white structure, the white power would come after him and lynch him and stuff like that. In this story, okay, I think we have a very different view of what the gun inequality means to Richard Wright. I think manhood is defined as very subjective. I think that as we grow up, Our manhood is defined by the culture that we're raised in, and that could be something that comes up from a cultural standpoint, ethnic, race, religion, whatever it may be, is going to be a huge influence to that. And it's almost very prescriptive from the whites in this story, is how Richard White presents it. Yeah, and he's defining his dreams, his goal of owning this gun, and that he'll be able to finally start taking care of himself, and that's what he believes it is to be a man, is that he's going to be able to take care of himself. He shucks responsibility when he leaves at the very end, and he shucks fault for killing Jenny when he tries to lie about it later, and he finally makes a choice on what he's going to do because he thinks that's what is the definition of manhood, is that he is making choices for his own life, and whether it be a good or a bad one, he actually has finally done what he thinks it is to be a man by taking hold of his life and making a choice of what he's going to do moving forward, and not his mother and father making those decisions for him when he hops on the train and leaves. Or Mr. Hawkins that tells him what his life is worth and what he needs to do to work off his debt. 
Um, which brings us full circle as to why the story was a, about starring a young boy, why it was about manhood, and how ultimately manhood is about choices and it's a subjective cultural thing. Yeah, and I think that we can see that in the story when Dave takes the gun and he points it at the White House and he pulls the trigger. He's making a choice of this is what I do would do if I could as a man. So for people that maybe don't know what the history of in Southern America, a lot of power was in plantations. The more land you owned, the more slaves that you owned in the era of slavery, the more power and even just and by what does power mean? It means you were writing the laws. It means you were influencing the lawmakers. It means that you were able to do what you wanted with things. Now, post-Civil War, in the era when Richard Wright is writing this, plantations still had that symbols, particularly in literature, that this man, Mr. Hawkins, with the big house, when he's aiming the gun at it and kind of taking his fake shot at it, he's taking his shot at the man, at the guy that used to be in power for him, as he starts to come into his own, is kind of how I interpreted it. And yeah, and it's kind of crazy to think about, too, is that Dave has already actually done some harm to Mr. Hawkins by shooting Jenny the mule, right? Here's a quote at the end when he says, When he reached the top of a ridge, he stood straight and proud in the moonlight, looking at Jim Hawkins' big white house, feeling the gun sagging in his pocket. What do you think that means? I think this is something very subtle, and I think a lot of people would miss it, but I believe that the sagging of the gun is the burden of making adult decisions. He wants to shoot the house that represents yeah. this oppression upon him based mm -hmm. on race. It's a white house. It's that big Victorian house on the plantation. And this is weighing heavily on his soul. I think it's it's burdening him. It's bringing him down. And he wants to do it, but I don't know if he would because he doesn't know if that's what a man would do. Well, all he's known his whole life has been servitude. He served his parents, he served Mr. Hawkins, he's known hard work, and we saw that the family constantly lives in a poverty state. So here's the question, we have this quote, all he did was work, they treat me like a mule, and then they beat me. He gritted his teeth, and Ma had to tell on me. So why do you think he was compared to a mule at this point in time, and what do you think it means that in the story, Jenny the mule was shot? I think the mule represents Dave himself. Mule is working hard all the time. It's a servant, just like Dave is a servant. And when Dave kills the mule, accident or not, maybe subconsciously he did it, he's killing the servitude. He's killing mm. that link of what he is going to have to do according to somebody else. And he's giving himself that freedom. He's making a decision. Right. Yeah, consciously or subconsciously, he's definitely making a decision to, I'm no longer going to be holden to your values of what a man is. I'm no longer beholden to what you are going to tell me to do. I'm going to make choices for myself. Because it's interesting, too, because the white man with the power in the story that Richard Wright, I feel like, is writing towards, he says to Dave, your life for the next two years is dedicated to paying off that mule that you decided to shot to shoot. So he's saying my property of this mule is worth two years of your life in my fields. And I think it brings it back to a very subjective, right? Like, why does this guy get to make the decision that the mule is worth X amount of dollars right. and that that's equivalent to X amount of years of Dave's life? It's all made up. Right. I mean, right? I mean, he could have said any amount he wanted. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Actually, I didn't do any research to how much mules were at the time, but that's how... <laughs> Just interpretively how I took it is this is him putting on whatever value he wanted for Dave. To keep him in that servitude, just like many of the laws had done to keep those tenant farmers to toe the line. And we're back to the sharecropping and the tenant farming that we were talking about earlier. So I would say masterfully done by Richard Wright. Clearly, I understand why this is one of the most popular and studied stories today because of how well he connects these decisions, these power and class struggles between the races. He did an amazing job with this piece. 100% agree with that. I think this is a very inspirational story, him writing it to future generations along with his own generations at the time. Everybody can take something from this story, no matter which you're on the side of. And I think that a man or woman, I think it's just more about growing up and becoming your own person. 
uh, culturally, subjectively, whatever you think that is, becoming your own destiny, choosing your own destiny. Uh, this story is fantastic all around. Uh, I'm going to give it a nine on both. Bam. Because this is the quintessential what does a gun mean and what does it mean to come of age? Doesn't get much better than this. Yeah, clearly one of the most studied, one of the most assigned pieces in American literature. And I can fully understand why, because it's so subtle. The way it, it it works in these class things, these these racial divides, the way it works in decisions, it doesn't beat you over the head with it, but you don't feel like you're floundering for what it means to really, really just, if there's a line, he is on it and nails it with the story. I'm going to go with an 8.5 as I really enjoyed this story and highly recommend it to people if you haven't read it already. I would love to have a study done if it would be possible to see how many people read this story, young black men, black women, or just young poor black people, poor people in the South, and how many made the decision to say, you know what, I'm fed up with this. I'm going to take my destiny in my own hands, and I'm going to move north, and I'm going to go to Chicago. I'm going to go to Baltimore. I'm going to go to Philadelphia. I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to make my own way in this world. I wonder how many people he inspired, because even if it was one, I think he did himself justice, and uh, he changed the country for the better. Yeah, well, that's why we choose the pieces that we do. This is not just for fun. This is not just for us. This is for the importance and understanding of the human condition. So if you were down for that type of a mission statement, if you were down for the stories that matter, please hit that subscribe button and join us on following the adventure. Una out. Peace.